Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 814. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 1st, 2023. All right, welcome to The Happy Place. This is where George and I sit down in front of our webcams and talk about the things that we find interesting, that we find on the, the internet throughout the week. And we found the, about seven or eight stories here that we're going to talk about. That's pretty cool. Before we get to that, how you doing, George? I'm doing just great. Having a wonderful day. Uh, what can I say, Kevin? I just love life. <laughs> you do. And you live in Florida, so you don't have to pay uh, income tax on, you, on the love of life you have. Uh, politics are getting stranger out there, but we'll see if we can talk about that at the end of our episode. Uh, guys, it's th it's summer, so it's the doldrums of news in the, uh, the Christian news world, because this is when uh, hopefully people are taking some time off and uh, priests are taking their vacations and they're they're having less news to produce that we get to talk about however i read that george bell has been welcomed back to the family the the church of england family that is george yes the cathedral chichester cathedral has renamed a building after george bell that previously had been named after him if you'll remember there was a major controversy where uncorroborated uh allegations of sexual misconduct were leveled against George Bell, one of the great, if you, I would say, saints of the Church of England in the 20th century, and there weren't mm -hmm. that many of them. No. Bell uh, was accused of molesting children and all this terrible stuff. And before any investigations, before anything was done, the Bishop of Chichester and the Archbishop of Canterbury just decided we're going to show how tough we are on child abuse and we're going to sacrifice George Bell and his reputation. This caused an outrage uh, uh, both in the church world and in the secular world. Uh, uh, Peter Hitchens, for instance, the Daily Mail columnist, was really active in this campaign to rehabilitate George Bell. Well, in uh, t January 2021, Welby finally had to apologize and said, no, I was wrong for doing all this and there was no evidence. And But his apology was done with bad grace and all this typical, typical Justin Welby uh, apology. Uh, but this past weekend at the Chichester Cathedral, the last place where George Bell was a non-person, relented and renamed uh, the old priory, the old uh, residence building for the Archdeacon, the George Bell House again. So from an institutional point of view, George Bell's rehabilitation is now complete. Now the people who, who uh, Martin Warner, the Bishop of Chichester, uh, Justin Welby, <clears throat> the Bishop of Canterbury, the people who in essence put through this fraud against the church, no consequences to them other than the embarrassment of having to say they were sorry for having messed this up. Well, you, but, you yeah, say that you, can do anything you want to the dead, I guess. Yeah, well, and that's the point here. He isn't sorry, but this is his example of safeguarding. When asked if the Church of England uh, conducts safeguarding investigations, well, of course, look at George Bell. We got him, out yeah. of, uh, you know, we raised the dead on him and uh, made sure that his reputation was completely smirched and that's the church of england safeguarding and you will not find any apologies out of the head office for that uh we talked last week about or two weeks ago about stephen Contrell's uh lord's prayer oops where he uh, kind of a person whose intentions were good there's a song for that uh but uh just doesn't know how to tell how to explain himself and how to explain how some people are triggered by uh our father in the lord's prayer uh, stephen Cottrell, as archbishop of york gave the opening address to general synod last month mm -hmm. and 80 percent of his speech was about the need for christian unity uh, holding the church of england together however that received no coverage because he went off on this woke business about the Lord's Prayer being problematic because of its patriarchal nature, Our Father, and that there were some people who were offended by the Our Father and all this and that. And 
This caused a blow up. Now, some feminists uh, thought this was just wonderful because they want to de sex God. And, uh, or actually, in Hereford Cathedral, they've been calling God she uh, at a few liturgies. Where, but on the other hand, uh, rank and file Anglicans and traditionalists, conservatives, Anglo Catholics have all basically said, What are you talking about? Uh, and basically beat Cottrell up pretty roughly. Well, ye, on Sunday in the Sunday Telegraph, Cottrell, or Cottrell, however you say it, I don't particularly worry. Yeah, we'll say right. it the American way. <laughs> yes. We'll say it the American way. Uh -huh. Cottrell, uh, that way he can't sue us for slander or libel, <laughs> I guess, because we're talking about somebody else. <sighs> Cottrell yes, <right. laughs> uh, had an op-ed piece in the Sunday Telegraph where basically he explained what he was trying to do, which was to be sensitive for those people who had problematic relationships with their father and therefore couldn't imagine God the Father as love because they didn't like their fathers. But he did it with a lot, a high degree of bad grace. The, the overarching theme of his op-ed was, okay, some of you people are too stupid to understand what I'm trying to say. And, it, and he explained himself saying, yes, we can say the Our Father, but some people need to hold, cross their fingers or, you know, skip the uh, R in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They need to skip that because they're emotional wrecks. And we should uh, recognize that. I, I don't think he's made a situation worse because it'd be pretty hard to make it worse. It'd be hard. But he certainly didn't satisfy any critics that I can tell. Well, the, the reality on the ground is Jesus introduced that prayer to people who had trouble with their fathers. It's mm. not like this is the first time in history that somebody's thinking, ooh, trigger word, father. I'm sure Jesus was very well aware that things in the prayer, um, you know, especially the hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, is all triggering if you are of certain persuasion. And, um, mm -hmm. you know. I'm sorry, Cortel. You, you didn't. You didn't win anybody with your essay. Well, it, it again. It's what, what I would call a lost opportunity uh, for Cottrell to basically say, "Well, here's what the Lord's Prayer really means and how to understand it. And if you have a problem, here's how we can help you understand it and not be so hung up that you can't go forward." Instead, Cottrell focuses on the problem and basically doesn't really go any further. Uh, than say we need to acknowledge the problem. He doesn't really say what we need to do. He doesn't say something that I believe is effective in addressing a malformed image of God. Mm -hmm. One of the problems in modern, uh, I would say a problem in modern both charismatic and liberal theology is the godliness of God is being shrunken. You know, Jesus is our pal yeah. or uh, buddy, he, you know, <clears throat> our buddy, and he loves us just the way we are. And that sort of thing. And there's, and what that does is that that sort of go, that sense of the sovereignty of God, the omnipotence of God, that the God is responsible for all that there is and ever shall be, and that you know, his ways are unknown to us and mysterious and, you know, bad things happen and God is still in charge. One of the things I learned in my exorcism class is that God permits the demons to attack people. They just don't do it on their own. They're not like a bunch of bikers watching teenage girls walk by. God gives them permission to attack people. And this deeper theological sense of the sovereignty and the awesomeness and the majesty of God. Instead, we've got Stephen Cottrell talking about pop psychology and, you know, my father was mean to me and didn't buy me a pony or something. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, if God loves us just as we are, uh, would Jesus have had to die on the cross? I mean, no. no. So, uh, clearly, uh, those arguments are species at best. Uh, fun to play with in the mind and Bible studies, but 
in the end, they're easy to answer. Uh, we posted an article by Ian Paul on Anglican.inc, and he says the, bi the bishops in regards to LLF uh, in the Church of England are supposed to come together by this fall and present some form of unity or information or follow-up or something, but he says it, it may never happen, George. Yeah, he uh, Ian Paul is... Uh I guess I, we'd call him a friend of uh, the show, sure. uh, yeah. Anglican Inc. We publish his essays uh, when they come up on his website. Uh, we only publish half, then we link the rest to his website so you can follow, read it all there, yeah. which is the which is the polite thing to do. The standard, yes. And, and Ian Paul is basically saying is that right now the bishops are incoherent, that the, they're trying to put together this... Uh, compromise but neither side we've we're now at the point where the red lines are in place and there can't be a compromise uh between the traditional and the liberal wings of the church they just are have different religions these are george's words not ian paul's words now the bishops were supposed to by november come up with the great plan and the pastoral accommodation for those against it and all this and that and there's little evidence that this is going to happen or that uh, things are going to come together by November. Now, I very much expect that they'll publish something in November because that's when Synod meets. And George and Justin Welby will say, Victory. oh, this is a wonderful thing. <laughs> yes. But the <clears throat> meat of it will be kicking the can down the road for another few years because... Welby's big thing is unity, unity, unity. And if he pushes too hard on this point, that will fracture the unity. The bishops have been saying, no, no third province, no uh, allowing conservatives to have their own bishops, nothing like that. And what the uh, Church of Evan England Evangelical Council and other organizations are saying is that, look, if you're going to go this way, it's either uh, schism, schism, or accommodation and we cannot accommodate you on this point because we believe it is a fundamental denial of the truth of the gospel well this whole time they've been trying to change the doctrine of the church of england without changing the doctrine of the church of england now mm -hmm. the episcopal church has been successful in uh, getting around these clauses and certainly the uh, anglican church in canada has uh, fought through these perils of changing doctrine uh, but the Church of England is stuck here because people are so hyper aware of the commas, the dotted I's, the cross T's, and all these documents. And they've been paying attention because they watched what happened in the Episcopal Church. We don't want that to happen here. Yeah, the, the Episcopal Church is more like uh, that scene from the movie Treasure of Sierra Madre, where Mexican bandits come and surprise Humphrey Bogart. Yes. And Bogart says, where are your badges? Don't need no uh, stinking badges. <laughs> we don't need no stinking badges. Episcopal Church, we don't need no stinking theology. No. We're going to do what we're going to do, 50% plus one. And since the kooks run the show, we'll do what the kooks want. Uh, but the Church of England uh, has uh, more... Uh, I mean, the Episcopal Church did all these theological studies, and their theological studies came out where we can't agree. Yeah. There's no division. There's no one thing. And so the liberals then said, ah, well, since we're in the majority, we'll impose our views on everybody else. And if you don't like it, they'll love. You're going to lump it. And the difficulty, I think, for Welby is that if you read the Twitter remarks of the activists in the Church of England, they're identical in tone and temperament. Jane Ozan, for instance, uh, one of the activists on the uh, lesbian and gay front is essentially anybody who disagrees with her is committing violence against gay people. Uh, it's, you know, if you hold a traditional Christian view that has been held by, you know, for 2000 years, you are uh, transphobic, homophobic, misogynist, evil person. Mm -hmm. That's the language that of Susan Russell in the Episcopal Church from the Diocese of Los Angeles about 20 years ago. So we're, ha and you and I think the funny thing is people would say, but oh my, you know, the, the activists, they don't drive the church. Well, yes, they do. Well, they did in the Episcopal Church. 
I mean, it, it was the far left kooks who 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 dro- who seized the steering wheel. I think we talked about this before that the problem with the Episcopal Church is the minorities had a loud voice, and they knew how to work the system. They knew how to work themselves into the hierarchy of power within General Convention, within 815, within um, uh, diocesan uh, standing committees where, you know, they knew how to work up the, the chain of command and control things. And they did that very well to the point the, the Episcopal Church imploded and exploded at the same time. Well, my experience in the Episcopal Church, and this is a broad, gross general, general generalization, and I'm sure many people can think of... Uh, contrary examples, but a successful, mediocrities make up the majority of deputies to general convention. Absolutely, yeah. They are not, they are not top flight people in terms of ability, experience, talent. Why is that true? Well, in the Episcopal Church, uh, my experience over 30 years has been that a dynamic, powerful parish rector gets nothing by getting involved in the diocesan affairs or in national church affairs. We don't benefit from it in any way financially, politically, and that we get nothing uh, in return for our money. It's, and and it's, so wasted ti- it's wasted time, not just it's money. It's wasted time. Right. Now, the, the rectors or the vicars of dying parishes that are only kept open because of the largesse lages of the bishop they're the ones that flock to serve on committees. They're the mm-hmm. ones that want to be on because they want something out of general convention, whether it's affirmation of uh, their particular theological viewpoint, uh, whether it's to free Mumia Abu Jamal, which is a perennial thing at, you know, a cop killer from mm-hmm. Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. You know, with, that's a perennial general convention resolution. Or they want money to keep their particular uh, project going. Uh, because the Episcopal Church is schizophrenic in that it is congregationally, it operates congregationally, but is Episcopally led with a synodical government, those three pieces don't mesh. So the reality is, for instance, for me, I I have nothing to gain from investing a single hour in national church affairs or even in diocesan affairs. That hour I has taken away from building up this congregation, which is how I, if you will, view my and my compensation, if you will, <laughs> is based on how well this <clears throat> congregation does. Mm-hmm. It's not based on the diocese in any way, shape, or form. So all the incentives are for the uh, more capable people to invest in where they get the biggest return. And for those people who can't make it without help, they invest in these bigger entities to try to suck money and power and influence into their lives. And for them, they're being virtual signalers. Virtual signalers. I can't even talk today. Sorry, guys. Something outside this camper is making me allergic to something. It's got my, my throat. And, you know, that is the big problem with having national entity polities like General Convention, um, where they have so much power and influence over the parish. Um, and they control, eventually, doctrine. That's why the Episcopal Church's doctrine has you know, been so sullied over the last 12 years. Well, let's see here. What's our next story? Santamu. Yep, Santamu. Uh, there we posted an article on Anglican on Anglican.inc that says his hands may have been tied regarding investigation of safeguarding uh, because he was no Justin Welby. There's a fascinating article by Philip Jones from the Ecclesiastical Law blog, and we posted that on Anglican Inc. And actually, it's, I think, our pinned story for today. Yeah, I think so. And it takes the contrary view that Santamo is being treated unfairly. And it's written from a legal perspective. Now, remember, Santama was a lawyer before he became a priest, so his brain operates on legalities yep. and whatnot. Baron and Santama, Santama was quoted yeah. as Tama was quoted as saying that safeguarding doesn't trump <clears throat> church law. And unfortunately for John Santama, his lack of PR skills in this area has bitten him. He didn't know when to. He didn't know when to shut up. Uh, the 
Philip Jones' article makes the point that the archbishop's powers in a province are not identical to a bishop's over a diocese. The archbishop is not a pope over a province. So what does that mean? He does not have the right to intervene in diocesan affairs at his pleasure or at his leisure. The this l rules are quite specific. He can only intervene when there are specific criteria or red lines m met. And when he does, he must step in in a quasi-judicial or uh, unbiased affair, uh, unbiased manner. He must adjudicate what this problem might be. So, the co and, and Jones contrasts what Welby's done with what Sentamu did. Welby jumped into the Diocese of Lincoln in uh, 2020, I think, or 2019, yeah. and suspended the bishop. Uh, what was the exact? Uh, I've written it down here he would present a significant risk of harm by not adequately safeguarding children. So the bishop is removed from, suspended from office because Welby said this red line was met. And in uh, November of 2021, Welby had to apologize saying, well, that red line wasn't really met. And uh, I was wrong to have jumped in. And Welby's conduct in the George Bell affair what is Welby doing in something that's entirely a diocese of Chichester affair? Welby's jumping in, making judgments, making statements, rubbishing George Bell. And of course, Welby had to back away from it. And so Jones's uh, uh, argument is that um, one archbishop is required to apologize for his intervention in diocesan cases while well, another archbishop is sanctioned when he refuses to apologize for not intervening in diocesan cases. So maybe I need to rethink my blanket condemnation of Johnson Tamu, because if he is allowing it the law to lead him, maybe he did the right thing in sitting on his hands. I, maybe I don't the think wrong so. law I, is wrong. I, I, no, I don't think so. In fact, if you look at the first comment at the in that article, uh, at the bottom of the article, it, it pretty much uh, exonerates our opinion uh, that we expressed last week and in, in the in the two weeks before that. That you know he he's been accused of not acting as a metropolitan, of course, uh, but his job and role is to uh, oversee the diocese and the actions within it. And uh, when a certain person did not uh, uh, report uh, a safeguarding issue, he should have stepped in because he knew about the issue. And he knew it wasn't being reported. So, you know, well, I think I'm I glad think in this safe. case, Kevin, we were right. <laughs> yes. But we, we, we do sometimes like to double check ourselves. We do. We Absolutely. I can't, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, Lambeth calls. The final document has appeared online. Oh, boy, I am excited. Um, but both sides, according to this document, have long deep study and prayer behind their opinion and you you and i know that the last lambeth was a complete fudge that uh many of the uh, global south archbishops walked away and said we're never coming back well we said it could never have been better and uh that can be seen here in the lambeth calls doc document they just published george yeah the uh document was the Lambeth Conference report, mm -hmm. and that it included the calls, some of the major speeches, and sort of the cutesy stuff that they always like to do, you know, pictures of of people from all around the world, you know, the National Geographic type photos. <clears throat> well, the Lambeth calls, if you remember, was one of the mar points of controversy. These were to be the study uh, uh, questions or issues for different things. And when they were written, and they had a committee to write these, and then when they were printed for the first time before the conference, it was found that the Lambeth, Lambeth Palace staff had changed the calls in the discussion of human sexuality to basically state, well, the Anglican Communion's position on human sexuality was stated in Lambeth 110 of 1998, which is homosexuality, is we cannot recommend this liberalization. Right. Well, the liberals blew up, said, hey, we didn't agree to putting this in. And so, without consultation of anybody else but the liberals, Welby changed the calls. 
uh, changed the call a bit. He wa washed water down the language. And then we had the conference itself. And then during the conference, the calls were changed again. And then the voting procedures were changed. And then the discussion procedures were changed so that at the end there was no voting no discussion discussion just small group meetings which went nowhere and did nothing and now the final conference report has been published and the calls have been changed yet again in human sexuality right now friends i read this so you don't have to okay this is not going to be an amazon top 10 <clears throat> uh book but the Lambeth calls are now stating that those, it, it starts off, those in favor of the traditional world uh, Anglican viewpoint on human sexuality, that uh, sexual relations are properly between a husband and wife in a monogamous lifelong marriage. They've reached that point after deep study and theological and prayer and theological consultation. But those who think differently who think that uh, gay couples should be blessed by the church, they've reached that point, the Lambeth Calls say, after theological consultation, biblical study, and deep prayer. So where Welby has officially left things was his off-the-cuff state, was that off-the-cuff statement he made during the conference that basically caused the Global South to blow up. If you remember, Welby said in his speech on this point that both sides have equally valid points of view. Right. Yeah. And so it had, it had gone from this is the church's unchanged teaching handed down from the apostles and is scripturally based for 2,000 years. And this is the other view that's just come around in the last 25, 30 years. That was changed to we now have two of equal merit and we can't choose or decide between the two. Now, I can tell you from an Episcopal perspective, no deep theological Bible study was done. It's all been a farce, and it's all been political from beginning to end. And when deep yeah. theological study and Bible study was done, the answers came out against the people who wanted change. So that today, if you ask, if you ask biblical scholars, uh, not necessarily partisans, but if you ask true biblical scholars uh, like... Uh, Who's that fellow? Uh, ben Witherington, or it'll come to me, Timothy. Uh, well, the point is, people in favor of the change, who are biblical scholars, are saying the those in favor of the change basically have to overcome the fact that the scripture is wholesale against it. Yeah. So we, in other words, you basically cannot make the argument from scripture, and this is being put forward by nonpartisan but liberal biblical scholars in the United States and in the UK. But Welby's point is that, oh my, it's so confusing. Our little brains can't take it. We're just going to have to get along and go forward from there. And we had hit that point about five or six years ago where the liberals had admitted they cannot overcome tradition, reason, and experience. Or tradition, <clears throat> reason, and um, what's the other one? Uh, scripture. Tradition, reason, and scripture. They, they could not overcome that. There was this admitting of it. But they said we have to move on and do it anyway to show our pastoral love and have a pastoral response. So they one-upped it. Yeah, we admit we can't overcome scripture, tradition, and reason, but this is a pastoral response, mm -hmm. you know, to, to show so our love. So we're adding, yeah. we're, we're changing the Anglican sort of identity or understanding from uh, Hooker's uh, three-legged stool yeah. of scripture, tradition, and reason We with uh, scripture being the center we're adding a fourth leg, which is experience, right. which trumps the other three. As Gene Robinson was very famous for saying, God is doing a new thing. We're living in the age of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit is leading us to step away from a, as he would say, wooden interpretation of Scripture and find its deeper meaning. Well, this is called Gnosticism, where the elect have a deeper understanding of the plain words of the Bible and of Jesus Christ than you or me. But nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. No, this, this is this heresy was around ago, yeah. two thousand yeah. years ago. It's yeah. around today in the Lambeth and in the Lambeth Calls document, which cannot be accepted. I would believe as a tr as a source of Anglican teaching. It's merely a reporting of the inanity and brokenness of our Anglican world. 
Let's have fun. We're going to move on to a, pro, a Pope Francis story, or as I'm going to retitle it, Pope Footloose. Uh, people have uh, the, Pope Francis has said no more Latin Mass, except on some high extended uh, reason that a bishop can overrule that. But uh, no Latin Mass ever done. Kaput. Now there's a Mexican uh, uh, congregation and uh, uh, what do I want to say, diocese, that wants to have dancing during their Mass, George. Indigenous. So they've introduced this as something that's uh, common to the people. And uh, I, I'm eager to hear what Pope Francis is going to do. Well, the Mexican Bishops' Conference uh -huh. has petitioned the Vatican to approve some indigenous liturgical adaptions of the mass for, quote, the original people of the country, the Indians. Yes. Uh, Indios. And uh, so maybe uh, in, uh, well, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> now, some of the, so, and so this is a special <clears throat> mass for Mexicans who identify as purely Indian, not mestizos, not of Spanish descent or what have you. Now, the Vatican has been quite keen to stamp out the traditional Latin mass, wherever right. it pops up, in favor of the modern mass in the vernacular language. And the Pope Francis has favorably received the Mexicans uh, request. Some of the adaptations include having a lay person sense the altar with incense instead right. of a priest, mm -hmm. having a lay person read what we would call in Anglicanism the prayers of the people or lead community prayer, and ritual dancing. In other words, you would have ritual dancing replacing or adding to some of the prayers at the Mass. Now, this on one level, this sort of reeks of the whole Pachimama stuff where the uh, goddess of the Amazon is brought as a suit, as a substitute Virgin Mary to Rome and the traditionalists throw at the Tiber and all this and that. But um, oh, as an aside, you should have heard what the exorcists in Rome were telling me about that whole thing. Uh, but this is another in George Conger's opinion, this is another slap at Benedict and the traditional Catholic wing of the church, traditional well, wing of the Catholic did, church. Didn't Benedict say no dancing? Benedict wrote a book. Benedict, when he was uh, president of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, mm -hmm. and then again when he was a pope, he has a book called The Spirit of Liturgy, and he addresses the question of dancing. And he says quite clearly, dancing is not an expression of Christian liturgy. He goes into its history. In the third century, the Gnostics wanted to introduce dancing to the mass. And the, and the patristic fathers said, no way, Jose, just as they should say to the Mexicans. Because what the Gnostics were thinking was that Christ crucified on the cross was merely an appearance, that before he went up into the cross, his body was, spirit was separated from his body. And so as we dance, we too can achieve an ecstasy of uh, of the separation of our bodies from our senses. And in the third century, the church said, nope, sorry, not going to do it. Well, Indian dancing is uh, it's introducing mystical and magical incantation <clears throat> along the lines of the Gnostic heresy of the third century. And I wrote down one of, I actually wrote down a quote instead of making it up. Benedict wrote, it's totally absurd to try to make the liturgy attractive by introducing dancing pantomimes wherever possible performed by professional dance troops, which frequently and rightly from the professional's point of view end with applause. Wherever applause breaks out in the liturgy because of some human achievement, it is a sure sign that the essence of liturgy has totally disappeared and has been replaced by a kind of religious entertainment. Now, there are some Anglican churches that are into Angl dancing, <clears throat> more on the charismatic, loosey-goosey side of things, and it's usually teenage girls wiggling about 
with veils and things like that. And we all clap like we're in a recital. Well, was not the consecration of Catherine Jeffert Shorey introduced with three uh, spirit dancers coming up the aisle? Yes, yes, yeah. all that crap, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> there have been diocesan consecrations where they have those dancers and stuff. Yeah. And Benedict writing from a Catholic perspective, I would say also speaks for the traditional Anglican perspective. When human achievement, when entertainment is a substitute for the mystery of the Eucharist, mm. you're not having a Eucharist anymore. You're having entertainment. It's it's my beef with the mega churches and the me and the and the fog machines and the bass guitarists strobe and all that stuff. Strobe lights, yes. Strobe lights. You're not worshiping Jesus Christ. You're having you're having entertainment. It's a way to tickle your, uh, not your soul, but your uh, emotions and your feelings. Well, I and think so, we've, as Christians in the last 200 years, we've lost the identity of what the sanctuary is, too. You know, that ability to come in and understand this next hour, few hours is set aside only and solely for the worship of God. Kevin, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm always leery because liturgy brings out the liturgy yeah, nuts. That's easy. No, no. <laughs> but liturgy, I think, can only attract people when it focuses not on me or on ourselves, but on God. When it got when a, when it focuses on God, allowing Him to enter and act in our lives, as you said, if it's God focused, but if it's dance focused or music focused or or it becomes recreational activity it's no longer christian one of the things and I, i'm not a liturgy nazi whatsoever is right before prayers of the people uh, the priest gets up and says i want to take this moment and do some announcements that gives me chest pain boy oh, oh, no this this whole moment this liturgy is all about something not involving announcements. <laughs> it's about pronouncement and what? Yeah, so whatever. I, yeah, I we don't have a dog in the fight over the tradi yeah. traditional mass Latin mass controversy. Um, no. Neither you nor I know enough Latin or any Latin to I be able know, to participate yeah. <laughs> effectively in a Latin mass. Really but it does seem to me that language aside, that. Allowing this sort of local adaptation sort of strips the sacrificial and Christ-centered elements from the Mass, from the Eucharist, from the Lord's Supper, yeah, we're covering all bases, mm -hmm. uh, and makes it basically a, just a sort of a, a tawdry image of the culture around us. And I, I don't want to get in too involved in this, but you don't have to go and look at too many pictures of the old Aztecs when they were dancing and doing their child sacrifices to know that maybe we don't want to include, you know, that culture's dancing in our liturgy. I'm just, you know, I'm throwing that out there. Just throwing that out there. So, you know, mm. just putting that way out there. What else we got here? Uh, I kind of want to save, Yeah, I want to save the next story partially for David Poliglia. We were trying to get a time when we can do an interview uh, with Anglican Scripted. He went to Poland and did a tour, uh, and so he's finally back. So sometime this week I hope to hit up with him. But let's do talk about the rise in Christian persecution in Israel. It's, um, it's now documented. It's not just something that's being whispered about. Well, you know, we remember we reported in January about David Pelegi's cemetery, Christchurch, mm -hmm. Jerusalem, some Jewish extremists, uh, uh, self-identified Jewish extremists, uh, right. who for I religious reasons kids. went in yeah. and destroyed, the, the uh, teenagers went in and mm -hmm. destroyed headstones, including the, that of the first Anglican bishop in Jerusalem. And there are reports of just maltreatment of Christians. Uh, the German foreign minister visited uh, Israel recently, and there was a German abbot of one of the local convents or whatever. Um, and they were going to go to the, uh, I don't know whether it was Vad Yashem or one of the sort of tourist sites that you and I went to. And the tour guide asked the abbot to take his cross off. He had a big cross around his neck because it would offend people who were Jewish. And 
Channel 13, a Israeli TV station, decided to really look into this and say, is this just a bunch of cranks complaining about unkind, you know, the occasional unkind people and the local nut job being mean? And so what they did is they contacted a Franciscan friar and they sent one of their reporters and the reporter dressed up as a Franciscan friar and they walked from the Franciscan convent to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre through the old city of Jerusalem. And on there, and he had a hidden camera and on his walk, they were spat on, they were insulted, they were shoved once or twice, they were treated really badly as if they were Jews in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just, and it wasn't just nut jobs. There were soldiers in uniform who did this, young children who were doing this. And this got onto the Israeli television and the secular Jews were horrified that, uh, that Israeli citizens, residents of their country were being treated like dogs. Um, so this isn't so much an Israeli problem as it is a problem of religious extremism and we're seeing, and, and it's maybe I'm overdoing this, but you know, we're seeing the transgender people go really wacky lately. The gays and lesbian groups going out of control, militant Islam, militant Judaism, militant Buddhism in uh, Sri Lanka, beating up Christians. Everybody seems to have got their underwear all tied up in a twist or something. Well, I think one of the biggest problems, and adding to the discussion, minority has learned to seize power. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of Americans do not agree with it, what's happening on the coasts. They don't agree with the immigration policy, the uh, health policy, the CDC policies, uh, anything coming out of the White House. They didn't agree with half of what happened under the Trump administration or most of what's happening under the Biden administration. The, the, the flyover country is not happy with it. They aren't. But the extremists have learned to capture and have the loudest voice. They do that in religious extremism. They do that in politics. They do that in transgenderism. Uh, it, it ha it's happening around the world. And the last time we've seen something like this happen, millions of people died because of uh, revolutions in countries and uh, um, the false ideology of the youth. And yeah, I'll have to see if this happens again this way. You know, not mm. pretty. Not pretty at all. Anything else you want to talk about here? No, I'm just looking through some headlines on Daily Mail to, if you want to expand our 10 minutes here. But I think we're going to let the average viewer out there have some time off and enjoy the summer. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 814 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>